we will discuss ratio analysis in this lesson. Now, ratio analysis is the most common way of comparing accounting numbers. Before we discuss liquidity ratios, let's first consider the concept of liquidity. Liquidity refers to the readiness of assets to be converted into cash. What this therefore means is, liquidity refers to how much cash a company has, how much cash is coming in the door, and how much cash can be raised quickly. Companies must generate cash in order to pay their debts, pay their employees, and provide their shareholders a return on investment. Cash is therefore critical to a company's survival. Liquidity ratios measure the ability of a company to pay its short-term obligations as they become due. Examples of liquidity ratios are current ratio, quick ratio, and working capital. The current ratio, which is calculated by dividing current assets by current liabilities, allows for inter-firm comparisons of the ability to pay current obligations. The quick ratio or asset test ratio is calculated by excluding inventories and prepaid expenses from current assets before dividing by current liabilities. What this means is quick ratio provides a more stringent indication of a company's ability to pay its current obligations. Net working capital or working capital is a popular measure of a company's ability to satisfy its short-term obligations. It is calculated as the difference between current assets and current liabilities. Now, before we end our discussion on liquidity ratios, it is important to emphasize that while liquidity ratios such as the current ratio, quick ratio, and working capital provide a useful indication of liquidity, it would also be helpful to know when the cash flows from current assets will be realized. It is also helpful to know when the current liabilities will need to be paid. This is because an excess of current maturities over the realization of near-term cash will cause a liquidity problem regardless of the level of the overall liquidity ratio. It is also important to compare the liquidity ratio calculated with the liquidity ratio for firms in that industry. Now the first solvency and financing ratio we will consider is the liabilities to equity ratio. This can also be referred to as the debt to equity ratio. Now this ratio indicates the extent of reliance on creditors rather than owners in providing resources. The ratio is calculated by dividing total liabilities by total shareholders equity. This implies the debt to equity ratio or liabilities to equity ratio indicates the extent of trading on financial leverage. Now remember that financial leverage is the amount of borrowing, liabilities. Now favorable financial leverage means a company is earning a return on borrowed funds that exceeds the cost of borrowing the funds. Now the second Solvency and financing ratio we would consider is times interest earned ratio. Now, the times interest earned ratio indicates the margin of safety provided to creditors. It is calculated by dividing earnings before interest and taxes by interest expense. Now, earnings before interest and taxes is income before subtracting interest expense and tax expense. Now we can calculate 
EBIT or earnings before interest and taxes using net income, adding back interest expense, and then adding back tax expense. Now note that a low times interest ratio is a cause for concern because that would indicate that the company has a lower ability to pay its debts as they become due. Now it's also a cause of concern because such a company would have difficulty increasing its borrowing. For example, to expand its operations to take advantage of growth opportunities. Now conversely, a high times interest earned ratio implies that a company has a greater ability to pay its debt obligations as they become due. And that also means that there's less solvency concerns for that company. Using the DuPont framework, we are able to analyze the underlying reasons for a company's ROE by drilling deeper into the ROE and looking at how the profitability, efficiency, and financial leverage ratios influence the calculated ROE. So let's examine the component ratios. The first ratio we'll focus on is the profitability ratio. And under that, we have net profit margin. It is calculated as net income divided by sales. And it indicates how profitable a company is with respect to sales. Note that net profit margin depends on both the gross profit margin and the ability of a firm to control its expenses. Note that reducing operating expenses such as advertising and research expenditures can increase current operating profit at the expense of the long-term competitive position of a firm. Now, such earnings management practices sacrifice long-term benefits for short-term earnings targets. And this is because expenditures on advertising and research often create long-term benefits. Now, let's look at asset turnover. Now, the asset turnover ratio measures the amount of revenue compared with the investment in assets. Generally speaking, we want turnover to be higher rather than lower. Turnover measures productivity, and we can say that an important company objective is to make assets as productive as possible. Because turnover is one of the components of ROE, increasing turnover increases shareholder value. What we can therefore say is that turnover should be viewed as a value driver. Now, average total assets divided by average shareholders' equity measures financial leverage. Now, recall from our prior discussion that favorable financial leverage means earning a return on borrowed funds that exceed the cost of borrowing the funds. This implies increasing leverage increases ROE as long as the assets earn a greater operating return than the cost of the additional debt. Note that financial leverage is also related to risk, so it has an upside and a downside. For example, the risk of potential bankruptcy would increase when financial leverage increases. What this means is that companies must balance the positive effects of financial leverage against their potential negative consequences. So it is for this reason that we do not witness companies being entirely financed with debt 
Now, our final discussion in this lesson will be focused on some of the limitations of ratio analysis. Let's now consider measurability and possible limitations relating to measurability. First, let's note that financial statements reflect what can be reliably measured. This results in non-recognition of certain assets, often internally developed assets, which are the very assets that are most likely to provide a competitive advantage and create value. Examples are brand name, superior management team, employee skills, and a reliable supply chain. All these items will not be reported in a company's financial statements because they are internally developed assets and reliable measurement of these assets are an issue. Now, related to the concept of measurability is the expansion of costs relating to assets that cannot be identified with enough precision. Examples are brand equity costs from advertising and other promotional activities and research costs relating to future products. All these items are expensed because it is not possible to identify these assets with enough precision. Now let's turn our attention to historical costs. Many assets and liabilities in the financial statements are recorded at original acquisition or issuance costs. Now subsequent increases in value and declines in value are very often only recognized if deemed permanent. That implies the asset and liability amounts used in the ratio analysis may not be good indicators of the current market values of these items. Now that will limit the information conveyed by the ratio that has been calculated and that will be a limitation. Now this ends our discussion on ratio analysis.